want to say I've been car free since 1975, roughly. I own a truck. <laughs> 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 a little bit of a redneck, I guess, when it comes to that. But the, uh, uh, some things happened uh, in the last few years that made me start doing a little bit of research on biosphere reserves in, in South America, Central America, and Mexico. And the first thing I had to do was start looking up at, at some of the history of them. And the, uh, by the beginning of, I, excuse me, I got notes here. I'm not good at reading from notes. Normally I just shoot from the hip, but I wanted to try to follow this somewhat here. By the beginning of 1994, the descendants of the Mayan, the, the, uh, in, in Mexico and Central America, and the, uh, they were facing extermination as a community. Their land was wanted by, by very wealthy cattle ranchers. They, wherever they were, they, they cleared their, their areas where they farmed, where they had their, really their thatch huts and their, with their dirt floors, and they, their one acre or two acres of, of growing squash and potatoes and different vegetables and, and, and raising chickens or pigs or whatever. They were being pushed out by these wealthy cattle ranchers. And, the, uh, and of course, they're on the Yucatan Peninsula, on Mexico, for example, there's, you know, it's known for some of its oil and the oil wells that exist down there. And the, uh, and the, uh, but it was, and these forests wanted by the paper companies. And, and another category of people wanting them were the uh, Marriott hotels or the big, uh, you know, the resort areas, Cancun, you know, all kinds of areas like this. But the, uh, but another group that wanted was uh, the capitalist planners eager to exploit the unique biodiversity of the jungle as a resource for future development in genetic engineering. Now, that statement came from the, the individuals who are actually stating why they were opposed in, in these biosphere reserves in Mexico and South America and Central America, why they were opposed to them. The, uh, they viewed it as the capitalist planners eager to exploit the unique biodiversity of the jungle as a resource for future development in genetic engineering. Because one of the things that was touted, that was touted here a lot, is we have to save the forest, we have to save the jungle, because there's medicines that can be found that can cure just about any kind of ill that's out there. And if we can save them and preserve them, then we can take and, and, and save society. And that was bought hook, hook, line, and sinker by a lot of people. The descendants of the Maya, who, uh, well, I'm going to call them the peasants, for simple, it's easier for me to call them peasants than anything because it's, they were. They, they lived in, in, in thatch huts with dirt floors and, and, and were roamed around the jungle uh, doing whatever they could to try to just feed their families. And they, uh, but they claimed that the attempt to protect biodiversity was nothing more than manipulation by corporate interests. A pattern developed where the areas where the peasants lived were classified as core areas and the areas where the oil companies, the cattle ranchers, the tourist hotels, and the other international corporate interests located became buffer areas or areas outside the reserves. Of course, it was the planners that made those determinations. These central planners that were creating these biosphere reserves, the first thing they do is they have to take and delineate the boundaries, just like here, where you create the core areas as, as to coincide with state land, and then the buffer areas and, the, uh, and you, you make your bridges, your land bridges, and everything else that goes along with it. They were doing the same thing there. So what they did was they took these jungle areas where these Mayans lived, these peasants lived, and these were declared core areas. And the buffer areas became something else. That's where you would have more of the cattle ranchers and the oil wells which would crop up, things of that nature. And, and this provided revenue, of course, for Mexico or whatever foreign country that it was going on in. The, uh, prior to the 1970s, the Mexican government recognized the right of the Maya peasants to the lands that are now designated as these biosphere reserves. The Mexican government had said that we got a problem here. This, the uh, all these where all these Mayan ruins are, and you got all these little thatch huts with all these these peasants that are living there. Uh, this was their ancestral home ground, just like the Native American, the the Indians that were here. This is, they, they, had, they had no concept of property rights. It wasn't, a, as far as for ownership of land, it was not a thing that was really recorded. They just existed. They just existed in an area. They lived their lives there. This was their world. And now what you had 
was the Mexican government coming out and recognizing this. And they said to these people that this is where you are, and we're going to set up a system where you can you can claim your ownership to your little farm or whatever you, you may have there, your little two acre plot, and this is this is your home. The uh, then in uh, in 1982, of course, the Mexican government defaulted on its debt, and they were bankrupt. They were broke, and they had a huge, huge problem. The uh, so part of the answer to that problem was the Mexican government started to privatize businesses and properties. And with the case of these biosphere reserves, these areas, the uh, conflicts emerged between conservation proponents and local communities, whole communities in these areas of, of these, this, these peasants. This happened because lands previously recognized the Mexican government to belong to the descendants of the Maya were now being put under control of the biosphere reserves. And the planners from these reserves we're starting to create the plans as to who had the right to be where, who, had, who owned what, you know, whether they were their lands or whether they belonged to some oil well or whether they belonged to some cattle rancher or what the case may be. One of the problems that the NGOs had with the establishment and control of the biosphere reserves was what to do about the local people that lived there. Take the, uh, excuse me of the pronunciation of this, these, these uh, Calamu, Cal, Calamu Biosphere Reserve, that was the one on the Yucatan Peninsula there, is, is surrounded and littered with Maya ruins and descendants of the Mayans. They were living all around these ruins and their thatch huts. These peasants lived all around them in the area of their ancestors. The answer that the NGO planners had was quite simple. They were going to bust them out of their homes to a different place, far, far away whole communities were told they had to leave, they had to go. They uh, you could put them up on buses and make them leave. You know what? In order to do this, of course, you have to go and say, hey, you know, we're on a bus, you know, you're gonna go. You know, the, uh, the dirt roads, it was, an, it was a very rugged area here. Buffer areas were awarded to the wealthy cattle ranchers, to the oil companies, to the resorts, and wealthy supporters of biosphere reserves or retirement homes in a beautiful, warm place overlooking the Gulf of Mexico. International corporations started exploiting the resources, and this helped the Mexican government with their money problems. The, uh, and when I'm talking about, uh, I was very, I, I want to be very specific about the, the, the wealthy uh, supporters of the biosphere reserves for retirement homes. Currently, Right now, when you look up on the web and, you, and you, you search down there, you'll find real estate agencies that talk about taking and, um, a process in which an individual can purchase that, that peasant's rights to their land in order to take and build their retirement home in, in, these, in these areas. There's a whole process, and I'll get to that a little bit later here. But the, uh, the, the problem of what to do with the peasants took on another form. The, uh, because they didn't want to leave. I mean, there were a lot like us up here, the peasants in the Adirondacks. We just don't want to leave. We, we want to, this is our home, we want to stay here. And so they, there had to be some kind of push to make them leave. How uh, do you make someone leave if they don't want it? I mean, here they're trying to starve us out, you know, and economically, you know, destroy the economy, and then, then you'll voluntarily leave, and your property can be sold to some wealthy elitist that wants his second home someplace. But down there, they're, they're peasants, they lived off the jungle, they, they lived in that area. Paramilitary groups were formed, and two of the peasants were killed. And it was only 130 some odd, I, that it was total, but they were actually killed. Now, it, it's, uh, uh, this uh, it prompted the peasants to voluntarily get on the buses. Hitler's Nazis, which had dragged Jews out into the streets and kill them for all to see. This would scare others to voluntarily get on the train. In <coughs> the Calamo Reserve, Biosphere Reserve, they use buses instead of trains. The, uh, the Biosphere Reserve program was being funded by the World Bank, the IMF.